This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to China Global Television Network. This is The World Today. I'm Mahia Mutua in Nairobi. Here are your top stories. China and Kenya sign a number of agreements during visit by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. We have an update on the ongoing unrest in Kazakhstan. And French President Emmanuel Macron faces backlash over his target of the COVID non-vaccinated. Welcome to the program. Now, China and Kenya have signed six memorandums of understanding. This comes during the second leg of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's Africa tour. The Chinese Foreign Minister is currently in the Kenyan coastal city of Mombasa. The agreements touch on areas of trade, infrastructure and other sectors. Wang Yi reaffirmed China's commitment to contribute to Africa's development and assist the continent in combating poverty. He also touched on China's dedication to helping the continent fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Wang Yi announced that Kenya will receive 10 million donated COVID-19 vaccine doses. The donations are part of Chinese President Xi Jinping's pledge to send 1 billion vaccine doses to Africa. Wang Yi also touched on China's commitment to helping secure the Horn of Africa region. Here is more on what both foreign ministers had to say. China agreed, I believe, to donate 10 million doses? 10 million doses of vaccine under the planned 1 billion additional doses of COVID-19 vaccines to Africa. And we thank you very, very much for that generosity. The so-called narrative trap, the, the debt trap, that is simply not a fact. It is speculation being played up by some with ulterior motives. And this is a narrative trap created by those who don't want to see development in Africa. If there is any trap, it is about poverty and underdevelopment. China would like to work with other countries friendly toward Africa and African countries to eliminate poverty and get out of underdevelopment and to realize recovery in the post-COVID-19 era and to contribute to Africa's pursuit for independent and sustainable development. Elsewhere, in Kazakhstan's biggest city, Almaty, police claim tens of rioters were eliminated as they tried to storm their offices. Footage posted on the internet shows protesters in the streets of Almaty as apparent gunshots are heard. A number of protesters stormed state buildings, including the presidential residence, and the mayor's office. The widespread protests were initially triggered by the fuel price hikes. President Kasim Jomart Tokayev has declared a nationwide two-week state of emergency. The government has resigned amid the crisis. President Tokayev has called the unrest a terrorist threat and appealed for international assistance. The terrorist mobs are essentially international. They underwent serious training abroad, and the attack of Kazakhstan can be and should be viewed as an act of aggression. For this reason, relying on the Collective Security Treaty, I reached out to the heads of the Collective Security Treaty Organization states today to assist Kazakhstan in overcoming this terrorist threat. In reality, it is no longer a threat. It is undermining the state's integrity. And most importantly, it is an attack on our citizens while asking me as the head of the state to help them immediately. Meanwhile, a Russian-led alliance says it will send peacekeepers to Kazakhstan to help stabilize the country. Well, staying with that story, the international community is following the unrest in Kazakhstan. The UN is calling for restraint and says it's important for all involved to promote dialogue to address the issue. Mikhail Bardavid has more. 
efforts to regain control of the cities, basically of the government buildings, of the government institutions, uh, is continuing right now in Kazakhstan as the standoff continues. Uh, there are reports that the control of the Almaty airport, uh, which had been seized by protesters where operations had halted, has now been regained by security forces. Accordingly, on the early hours on Thursday, uh, the deputy mayor of Almaty announced that an anti-terrorism operation had been launched and that the Almaty airport had been regained, uh, the control had been regained by the government and is now operational. Meanwhile, there have been calls for calm by international community as well. Uh, the spokesman for UN Secretary General stated that the international body is following the events very closely. Uh, they have called for calm from all parties to exercise a restraint, refrain from violence and to promote a dialogue. Meanwhile, there were statements from the United States as well. The White House Press Secretary Saki also called for calm and also said the protesters should be able to express themselves peacefully, uh, urging the authorities to exercise a restraint and once again to restore the internet service as well as there were reports that the internet was cut all across the country in Kazakhstan on Wednesday uh, in a statement by the United States. They also denied any involvement in the ongoing demonstrations. There was also some uh, unconfirmed reports showing that some videos by Russian television showed that some armed people were distributing some arms uh, to protesters on early hours on Thursday. So uh, it seems that potentially the situation could escalate uh, violently on Thursday. Now, some changes have been made to prevent similar incidents since the riot at the U.S. Capitol a year ago today. Thousands of supporters of former President Donald Trump had stormed the building, forcing the evacuation of lawmakers. The riot left five people dead and hundreds injured. Some say the attack exposed a deeply divided America. Despite the changes today, many questions and political divisions remain. Nathan King has more. A year after the insurrection, the investigation into what happened and those responsible continues. More than 150 of those involved have already been prosecuted. Hundreds more await trial. But what is far from decided is the political responsibility and ramifications for American democracy. On the eve of the one-year anniversary of the violent attempt to overthrow the election results of the 2020 presidential election, the U.S.'s top lawyer said there's no higher priority than holding all those accountable. The actions we have taken thus far will not be our last. We will follow the facts wherever they lead. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. The unanswered question one year on is how, who, and to what extent the administration of then-President Donald Trump is to blame for the insurrection and those behind-the-scenes attempts to overturn the election. A U.S. congressional investigation into that very question has faced opposition and obstruction from many former Trump officials. Then-Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is facing criminal contempt charges for failure to fully cooperate. Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon, too. Others have handed over documents and text message records which suggest to some members of Congress a pattern of planning for what became the riot at the Capitol, an attempt at persuasion to overturn the legitimacy of the election. But I will read a few of them. Mark, one member said, he needs to stop this now. In all caps, tell them to go home. POTUS has to come out firmly and tell the protesters to dissipate. Someone is going to get killed. Former President Trump has abruptly cancelled a planned press conference on the anniversary of the insurrection, just as more evidence comes to light of potential involvement of his administration and allies in the Republican Party and the media in planning and directing the events that led up to that fateful day. As President Biden will deliver remarks as planned. But beyond who was to blame, both on the ground here and politically on the January 6th, insurrection, coup, riot, whatever you want to call it. There are bigger questions in American politics too. The majority of Republicans still think that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, that the election was stolen. And we're seeing similar divisions in US democracy when it comes to something so simple as getting vaccinated against COVID. What happened here on January the 6th was essentially a microcosm of what is plaguing US democracy. Nathan King, CGTN, outside the U.S. Capitol.
the DPRK has successfully test-fired a hypersonic missile. The Korean Central News Agency reported that the missile precisely hit a target 700 kilometers away on Wednesday, proving the reliability of a new fuel system. This is the second test fire of a hypersonic missile after a launch in September last year. In France, President Emmanuel Macron is facing backlash and criticism over his use of vulgar language to target the non-vaccinated in the country. Critics have accused Macron of behavior unbecoming a president. The uproar prompted a delay in legislation over the government's plan for a new vaccine pass. The controversy was sparked by the president's interview in Le Parisien newspaper. He used a French verb that is considered vulgar slang to describe his strategy to make life miserable for the non-vaccinated in France. The country on Wednesday reported over 330,000 new cases, breaking the, deadly, the daily record set on Tuesday. Tennis world number one Novak Djokovic has reportedly filed a lawsuit in an Australian court against his deportation from the country. This is in response to Australia cancelling the Serbs' entry visa, Djokovic was initially granted a medical exemption from the country's COVID-19 vaccination requirements so that he could play in the Australian Open. But the Australian border force says Djokovic failed to provide appropriate evidence to meet the entry requirements. The nine-time Australian Open champion had landed in Melbourne without proof he was fully vaccinated. He was then taken from the airport to a government detention hotel. And that's it for this edition of The World Today. I'll be back shortly with more news from the continent in Africa Live. Thanks for watching. So this is it. I'm just about to be shot. Here. Bottles are being thrown as they do so. Uh, we there are about three critical <laughs> bridges <laughs> here in Malawi. That's one of them. We're going to cross that bridge. As you can see behind me, police forces who are replying with gas. Yeah, gas just That's came in. gas. So it's all begun now. Divisions leading the charge into West Mosul have brought us here. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse this is where most of the fighting has been concentrated. This is the front line now after nine days of fighting. We're about two to three kilometers from Within the front line. Within clear view of this front line position.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. China and Kenya sign a number of agreements during visit by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Somalia's Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble meets representatives of opposition presidential candidates as efforts to end election impasse continue. And a dead humpback whale washes up on a popular beach in South Africa. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. Wherever you're joining us, I'm Mahe Mutua in Nairobi. Also coming up, truckers paralyze operations on the Kenya-Uganda border in protest over mandatory COVID-19 testing fees. And in sports, COVID-19 hit Tunisia set for Sierra Leone friendly on Friday ahead of Sunday's Cameroon AFCON kickoff. Welcome to the program. Now, China and Kenya have signed six memorandums of understanding. This comes during the second leg of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's Africa tour. The agreements touch on areas of trade, infrastructure and other sectors. Wang Yi reaffirmed China's commitment to contribute to Africa's development and assist the continent in combating poverty. He also touched on China's dedication to helping the continent fight the COVID-19 pandemic Wang Yi announced that Kenya will receive 10 million donated COVID-19 vaccine doses. The donations are part of Chinese President Xi Jinping's pledge to send 1 billion vaccine doses to Africa. Wang Yi also touched on China's commitment to helping secure the Horn of Africa region. Here is more of what both foreign ministers had to say. China agreed, I believe, to donate 10 million doses? 10 million doses of vaccine under the planned 1 billion additional doses of COVID-19 vaccines to Africa. And we thank you very, very much for that generosity. The so-called narrative trap, the, the debt trap, that is simply not a fact. It is speculation being played up by some with ulterior motives. And this is a narrative trap created by those who don't want to see development in Africa. If there is any trap, it is about poverty and underdevelopment. China would like to work with other countries friendly toward Africa and African countries to eliminate poverty and get out of underdevelopment and to realize recovery in the post-COVID-19 era and to contribute to Africa's pursuit for independent and sustainable development. Well, for more on this, we're now joined from Mombasa by CGTN's Nick Mudimba. Nick, as we're hearing, a number of deals have been arrived at between China and Kenya. What more can you tell us about this? Absolutely, Mahia. Indeed, a number of deals have been reached between Kenya and China. Six MOUs have been signed. And I can confirm that six cabinet secretaries from Kenya's government are actually here just after the press conference, signed the MOUs. I can just take you through some of them, include infrastructure, building, trade, and investment. Now, another issue that also touched on was the Horn of Africa. The issue on uh, uh, issues going on between, um, l l let's say, extremists and government. So um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi assured Africa that this will be handled in a special way. A special envoy will actually be deployed to the Horn of Africa to sort out all this. Also, Mahia, the bilateral deliberations came through to uh, talk about trade between uh, farmers in Kenya and farmers in China. There'll be, of course, that uh, deepened relationship where by now farmers will be able to export, that is in Kenya, uh, avocados to China and vice versa. And of course, this will be one of the biggest, biggest win uh, as far as uh, farmers are concerned. Now, health vaccine production, Mahia, this was also touched. Now, Kenyan scientists will work hand in hand with Chinese scientists to come up with a vaccine in the country. And on top of the 10 million vaccines uh, being delivered in Kenya very soon, this will actually be a booster in Kenya's effort to fight COVID-19. Now, when we talk about poverty alleviation and helping those in hunger-stricken areas, 12,000 tons of rice 
will be delivered to Kenya to aid that. That means now this will also be coming soon. Now let's talk about the 8th Ministerial Conference FOCAC that happened in Senegal uh, late last year. This uh, will now be cemented, the implementation to make sure that indeed Kenya benefits from this will be cemented. Also, Mahia, the protocol and of course manufacturing support, innovation, ICT improvement were also touched. So all this, all in all, is actually for the benefit of the country and China coming through to help Kenya. Right, Nick. And uh, what development projects will the Chinese foreign minister be visiting while on the second leg of his Africa tour here in Kenya? At the moment, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi is actually at the Gipevo oil terminal. It's actually a new oil terminal that has been constructed by China, and of course, aided by the Kenya Airports Authority. This is a very special port because now this time round, vessels, a number of vessels, not only one, will actually be able to dock at the port. Also, the oil capacity handling. Kenya will now have the muscle strength to handle most of the oil because now the products have been very, very, very heavy for Kenya, but now capacity has been improved Maya to handle it. Also, there's a submarine um, kind of a space given uh, to, to that uh, construction because now that means the expansion will mean submarines can be able actually to come from different parts of the world and this indeed uh, boosts Kenya's economic um, uh, prowess, Kenya's economic uh, ability to actually uh, do trade with the most African countries and of course all over the world. Something special about the terminals is also that the previous one was a bit very slow. Technology was not that uh, uh, implemented well in terms of priority, but the Kipevu one, the new one actually, which is being inspected by uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and uh, Kenya's President Huru Kenyatta right now, is actually very, very uh, well uh, in terms of innovation, in terms of just capacity, and also all in all for the benefit of the port operations here in Kenya Mahia. All right, Nick, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, CGTN's Nick Mudimba joining us live from the coastal city of Mombasa. Well, let's get even more insights on this story. We're now joined via Zoom from Abuja by Ovigwe Egwegu, a pol policy analyst at Development Reimagined. Uh, Ovigwe, thank you for joining us. What is the significance of the continued tradition of China's foreign envoy visiting Africa first every new year? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think it's very symbolic and also also very substantive because if you look, for instance, at the you know the deals I've already seen from reports com coming of M MOUs being signed, it shows that when these visits do happen, they not only strengthen Africa-China relations in terms of you know building you know understanding, but also we use it as an opportunity to further deepen our cooperation because of course we know. There are so many areas where Africa and China can, and African countries and China can expand, you know, uh, cooperation. For instance, with Kenya, whether for you know trade, you know, and and, and investment, and also in, uh, investment in inf infrastructure. So whenever we get this opportunity, this opportunity to to welcome and receive the Chinese foreign minister, of course, it gives us that opportunity to work on these issues and how to chart the, the you know, to manage China Africa relations in a more closely and coordinated manner. And Ovigwe, how would you then describe China's support to Kenya with regards to development goals for the East African nation? I think it, it, it's been very key and, and very pivotal because if you look at over the years, in, in the last, what, maybe 15, uh, 20 years, if we've seen steady increase in, infra in investment in infrastructure in particular because, of course, we know the infrastructure deficit in the continent is massive and has been one of the biggest stumbling blocks to, to development because you can't you you have a lot of inefficient in terms of transportation within countries and sometimes these infrastructure that connect countries in is in uh, with with Kenya for instance are, are missing or they're not a, at a very standard you know level so with Chinese investment we were able to see you know greater uh, uh, you know uh, facilitation of trade within uh, within uh, Kenya and also with Kenya and and the rest of the continent and that's been very you know, been very crucial. A good example we are looking at now will be the, the Lamu port, where the third bed had just been, you know, uh, be completed and was launched just uh, weeks ago. That construction work, you know, was done, and that's going to be a very key part of Kenya becoming a, not just a, a, a major uh, hub for East Africa, but also connecting uh, East Africa with with the rest of the continent, with, cent with Central Africa. So that will be very very important part of Kenya's own development and also development. You know, in in the in the region. So even within Kenya as well, you see, you know, express express being being built. So cutting commutes commuting time for professionals and connecting 
you know, manuf uh, manufacturing and also agriculturing uh, hubs, you know, to, to domestic and you know, foreign markets. So these are various areas where there's very there's been very positive, you know, uh, growth and also impact in terms of Chinese, you know, investment for Kenya's development. Right. And uh, finally, looking down the road, what should be done, uh, in your opinion, to encourage transfer of technology from China in order to make Africa's development be more sustainable? I think one of the things areas we have to cooperate with China would be in terms of intellectual uh, property, uh, property regulation framework. Because if we, if, we do, if we do have, you know, approaches to intellectual property that are in favor of, uh, of uh, you know, attracting, are very attractive to Chinese companies, that will also add to the fact that many of them are already here, over 10,000 Chinese private firms are already here. If you can attract more of them and they have no issues around intellectual pro property and other, part, other regulatory issues, then they will come in and invest. And when they come with their investment, of course, they're coming with more technology because they are coming with manufacturing for the tech sector and you know, digital space. So when we, if you, can, you can attract them here, of course, by extension, they bring in the technology, apart from creating maybe special uh, programs for training and skill acqui acquisition, you know, and uh, other, you know, policy me mechanisms to get uh, acquired skills, the more you can actually attract these Chinese companies in the manufacturing sector, you know, tech, you know, tech sectors, the more you will have the skills back just by, you know, as a consequence. So I think it will be very crucial for African countries to look at how they can create that enabling environment you know, for Chinese firms because they are eager and interested in investing in Africa. And when they do so, of course, they bring in the technology and we will just have the technology as, you know, as an icing on the cake. So I think that would be very crucial, you know, going forward. All right. Thank you very much for that policy analyst at Development Reimagined, Ovigwe Egwegu, joining us live from Abuja as we continue to break down the Chinese foreign minister's visit to Africa. Moving on, several infrastructure projects being constructed by Chinese firms in Kenya are expected by mid this year. Key among them is the Nairobi Expressway and the Bus Rapid Transit System. CGTN's Enoxicolia looks at how Chinese-aided projects are changing the East African nation. A group of workers building the last pieces of concrete beams to be used in the construction of the expressway in Nairobi. Engineers are enforcing beams using a technique that up till now has been largely theoretical in Kenya. That is concrete that is, I would say, over-reinforced. So you're not just putting bars of reinforcement. You actually stretch the bars. Eh? So when you let go of them, they, they actually compel the concrete to come even closer together. Eh? So the concrete becomes stronger than it is. Eh? The Kenyan Principal Secretary for Public Work says the construction of the expressway has helped Kenyan students experience the technology that has enabled engineers to build longer and bigger bridges. We are using them as teaching laboratories, eh? so we teach in the universities, eh? but there is hardly any person in Kenya producing pristress concrete. Eh? The construction of the Nairobi Expressway is in the final stages. The road is expected to be ready for public use come May this year. It will be one of the most important pieces of transportation infrastructure in the Kenyan capital as it seeks to reduce traffic congestion. It's being constructed by a Chinese farm, China Road and Bridge Corporation, under a public-private partnership. So if you get private money, 65 billion, which will be put here, as foreign direct investment. There is nothing better than that. And so we wanted to, to, to show that PPP can work in Kenya and in Africa. Indeed, Chinese companies are undertaking several infrastructure developments in the capital city and across Kenya. Stekol Corporation is building the country's first bus rapid transit system. Like the expressway, the BRT project is aimed at decongesting Nairobi. A lot of people have told us that uh, our relationship with China is not beneficial. For those who say that, I request them come. Let them see a project like this. Let them see the project that we are done in Lamu. China Communications Construction Company is building Kenya's newest port of Lamu. Three baths have already been operationalized. 
The port is part of infrastructure project that Kenya is putting up in a bid to become East and Central Africa's major trade hub. Our partnership with China is one that is mutually beneficial, that is based on win-win, and we are very grateful to the Chinese government, to the Chinese people, for the support that they continue to render, not only to our country, but to the rest of Africa. With China's foreign affairs minister visiting Nairobi, Kenya is seeking ways of deepening this relationship. Enoxicoli, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, from even more on this, we're now joined from Beijing by Wen Ping He, a research fellow at the Institute of West Asian and African Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Wen Ping, thank you for joining us. How would you describe China's relations with Africa over the years? Well, thank you for having me. I think uh, China-Africa relations has been developed uh, very well over the years, uh, either uh, in, in, you know, in the area of economic cooperation and the political, those mutual trust, and uh, also like people-to-people, uh, uh, -people, this uh, communication. So I can say in all kinds of ways. For example, uh, in terms of uh, this uh, economic cooperation, China has been uh, now uh, served as the number one trade partner uh, with Africa ever since uh, 2009. And also, uh, you know, before the pandemic, I have been traveling to Africa also quite often. So whenever I was there, I can see those Chinese uh, uh, you know, engineer was there. They have been uh, engaged in a lot of uh, infrastructure construction, uh, either the road, expressway, or railway, or those uh, airport terminal. So it's very tangible, uh, visible. Uh, those uh, existence there. They have been made a great contribution for Africans' infrastructure. Uh, this uh, development, and also we have uh, built on. A very good and very effective uh, this uh, collective uh, collective this uh, you know consultative uh, mechanism that is the FOCAC. Uh, full name is China Africa Cooperation Forum. So FOCAC uh, was founded in the year 2000. Every three year it will have uh, you know a meeting a forum and then will come out with a very detailed those action plan. So covering all kinds of area, and then uh, come up with uh, uh, those numbers, uh, you know, like how many rural school will be built, how many hospital. So those things are measured in numbers. So it served as a very clear roadmap for guiding China-Africa cooperation forward. So with this forecast, and then following, I think uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, initiated from uh, in the year 2013. So those the a big uh, driving uh, engines uh, for pushing China-African relations forward. Right. And what would you say are some of the key benefits that Kenya, uh, that China rather is deriving in its continued engagement with Africa? Well, uh, if uh, we look about the China's benefit. Uh, of, of course, first of all, I think this is a mutually beneficial thing uh, for China and Africa. But if we focus on China's uh, side, I think first of all, we benefited a lot uh, from this uh, closer and closer China-Africa relations, those deeper and deeper China-Africa friendship. So that's why, you know, uh, uh, we have been working uh, so closely and uh, in terms of uh, a lot of uh, issues uh, even in the international stage like we both are calling for the multilateralism uh, we are against those uh, protectionism so we both like uh, calling for uh, the deeper this uh, economic globalization uh, rather than saying de-link or decouple between those countries so uh, this is the one of the beneficial things uh, china now we would like uh, to continue to strengthen our a closer relation with Africa. And in terms of like uh, economic cooperation, uh, China also benefit. Like uh, lots of Chinese companies, entrepreneurships, they have been getting stronger uh, in the way uh, they engage uh, themselves in the African those, uh, you know, projects. So Chinese companies going out uh, this uh, process 
I think has been developed and getting stronger yeah, with those projects finished in Africa continent. So Chinese, uh, those uh, companies are now, I think they getting stronger, they benefit from all kinds of those projects they have been engaged in. Plus, are those Chinese, uh, those entrepreneurship, uh, those uh, business person and those engineer, they all, you know, developed themselves with those uh, going out uh, this uh, process. Uh, the eye-opening, uh, those experience, either for those uh, top manager or even for ordinary, uh, those, uh, you know, workers. So this is uh, uh, another uh, benefit I can think out. And of course, like trade, uh, China's uh, industrial, this commodity, yeah, we uh, made in China and it goes to all of the world, including Africa. So this also benefit for Africans, those customers. So this is a mutually uh, beneficial thing. Right, and finally, how can the ties between China and Africa be enhanced in a mutually beneficial way? Well, I think uh, if we focus on a uh, mutually uh, beneficial way, I think maybe two things uh, we can uh, focus more. Uh, number one is uh, we need to uh, uh, you know, spend more efforts uh, to strike a trade balance. That is to import more African made those commodities. Uh, for example, I have uh, already noticed that uh, a lot of African companies, like uh, lots of African countries, now they join uh, this uh, Shanghai Import Expo uh, that has been, uh, you know, uh, kicked off in China, the Shanghai city, ever since 2018. So China also now aims to uh, transform ourselves from like a world factory uh, to a world market. So Chinese customer uh, is there, is ready. Now they are becoming the middle class and has a quite strong this uh, consuming capacity. So anyway, so through this kind of a Shanghai Import Expo and also through many other uh, ways like uh, uh, help African company and to uh, you know develop their uh, their those uh, commodities and added more value uh, in their commodities, uh, either agricultural uh, those products or other uh, things. And then I think uh, we can import more and more African commodities. So there is a goal has been set out already, saying in the coming uh, years, we are going to uh, import as many as like uh, $300 billion uh, was uh, this kind of uh, uh, amount of African commodities. So I think this is number one. Number two is uh, to improve uh, like technical transfer uh, to train more Africans, those professional, uh, this, uh, you know, human resources. Yeah, Africa is the young continent, the youngest one uh, in the whole of the world. So in the future, I think uh, like uh, uh, maybe 80% uh, of those workforce in the whole of the world, yeah, they are Africans. But Africans uh, need to get ready uh, for embrace this kind of a uh, future coming. So they have to improve uh, the technical know-how, the skillful, uh, those kind of uh, capacity. So this job, China can help to, uh, you know, to make it happen. Now we have been doing a lot, uh, like uh, industrial park, uh, special economic zone uh, in different African countries. And we also now to uh, do the investment to establish like a, a vocational training school. So all of those efforts uh, is trying to offer uh, this uh, technical transfer and uh, make those uh, you know, human resources, uh, this advantage becoming a real productivity capacity. All right, Wenping, Back thank you. you. Thank you very much for okay. speaking to us. A research fellow at the Institute of West Asian and African Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, Wen Pinghe, joining us live there. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi is set to visit Comoros to end his Africa tour, while Kista Nyabwa takes a closer look at relations between China and Comoros. Well, Kenya is a larger economy with greater influence, and Eritrea has made strides in peace building, Comoros is a small African country located in the Indian Ocean. 
Relations between China and Comoros were established by Comorian President Ali Soili in 1975 and have been described as friendly and cooperative. China was the first country to recognize independent Comoros in 1975. Since then, the relationship has been mutually beneficial with Comoros receiving aid, investment and exports from China. So far, China has partnered in major infrastructure projects like the construction of a new airport complex and the renovation of the People's Palace in Comoros' capital city of Moroni. A Chinese-assisted treatment campaign has been working to eliminate malaria from the Comorian island of Moheli. With a visit, analysts see Beijing focusing on stronger East African links. When announcing the visit, Zhao Lijian, spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, said, and I quote, it demonstrates the great importance China attaches to its traditional friendship with Africa and the development of China-Africa relations, end of quote. Under the Belt and Road Strategy, China has funded the construction of highways, railways and power plants across Africa. The two sides are now seeking to strengthen cooperation in fields including medical and healthcare, livelihoods, green development, digital economy and capacity building in order to contribute to Africa's post-COVID-19 economic recovery and sustainable development. Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian has said that the visit fully demonstrates the priority China gives to China-Africa relations and the growing profound friendship between the two sides. Comoros is a third stop in Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's first overseas trip this year. His arrival here underscores the importance of the relationship between these two countries as well as the hopes for continued mutually beneficial partnerships. Wilkesanya was CGTN in Moroni, Comoros. Right, well, it's time for a quick break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Somalia's Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble meets representatives of opposition presidential candidates as efforts to end election impasse continue. And a dead humpback whale washes up on a popular beach in South Africa. Hey there, my name is Asta Tao, and there are three things you should know about me. I love food, I'm obsessed with history, and I travel whenever I can. So join me as I explore cultures through food, meet innovative chefs, and celebrate Africa's diversity. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us on Africa Live. Let's turn to the Horn of Africa now as talks to end the election impasse in Somalia continue. The country's Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble held talks with representatives of opposition presidential candidates as well as international partners. The discussions are aimed at addressing the concerns of all sides so as to urgently conclude ongoing parliamentary polls before the crucial presidential elections. Here is CGTN's Mohamed Kahir with more from Mogadishu. The meeting entered its third day today, Wednesday, with members of the National Consultative Council, that's the Prime Minister, and five regional leaders from the states discussing the way forward on conducting already delayed polls. Earlier during the second day of their significant meeting, 
uh, the Somali leaders were joined by the international partners in the country, led by the UN Special Representative, uh, James Swan, as well as other diplomats in the country. Somalia's international partners reiterated their call for Somali leaders to conduct credible elections in the country. Somali Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Rogli held a closed-door meeting with representatives from the opposition presidential candidates where differences were ironed out. The opposition has also demanded a repeat of disputed parliamentary elections. Somali civil society groups, religious leaders, as well as traditional elders are also expected to be part of the meeting. All these separate meetings by the Somali Prime Minister with these different groups stress the need to conduct timely, transparent polls in the country. And we are expecting a communique out of this meeting in the next coming days. Hamid Kahie, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Well, let's now head to Uganda, where a strike by truck drivers from the East Africa region has entered its second day. The truckers, who are protesting against COVID-19 testing fees, have brought business at the Malaba border post to a standstill. Uganda recently introduced a mandatory $30 fee for all incoming travelers, including truck drivers. Isabel Nakiria reports. The protest by truck drivers has caused a pileup of trucks at the Uganda-Kenya border. Over 3,000 trucks destined for Uganda, Rwanda and South Sudan have paralyzed business at the Malaba border post. Trucks are lined up about 30 kilometers from Malaba to Bungoma in Kenya. The truckers are objecting to a COVID-19 testing fee, which they say is too high for them after they've already presented negative COVID-19 test results from their respective countries. Why are they rejecting corona certificates from Kenya if we are East Africans and yet we have already paid the fee? We are not going to pay any single cent. No truck will enter Uganda. At the beginning of the pandemic, Uganda was offering free COVID-19 tests to truck drivers, but a decision was made to introduce the $30 fee to cover government costs. Authorities in Uganda have now reduced that fee to $25, but that too is too high for those protesting. I am having meetings with the drivers. As I talk now, I'm the, I'm the next meeting with the Kenyan counterparts, which is going to be in KRA, Kenya, and we're still going to discuss issues of normalizing traffic. The Malaba border post is one of Uganda's major entry routes with thousands of trucks normally bringing in goods from neighboring Kenya's port of Mombasa every day. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. Let's turn to South Africa now, where a humpback whale has washed up on a popular Cape Town beach, attracting a large crowd of curious onlookers. The eight-meter-long animal is the second humpback whale to wash up on a Cape Town beach in under a month. Authorities believe the whale was part of a large pod that's currently visiting the Atlantic seaboard. CGTN's Travis Andrews has more details. Another humpback whale and another sad ending to their visit to the Atlantic seaboard. While authorities worked to retrieve the animal, hundreds of curious onlookers stood by watching the process unfold. The whale is the second whale to wash up ashore in recent weeks after arriving in a large group. We have had a large pod of whales, of humpback whales, off the Atlantic coastline. And it's not unusual with such large numbers that we have one or two mortalities. Um, so this washed up this morning. As I said, the, the cause of death is not yet determined. We cannot find any propeller strikes on the animal. So we do not think it was from a, a vessel. Um, so in all likelihood, it's likely to be a, um, a, cause, a natural death. While officials waited for high tide to tow the whale's carcass out to sea, scientists collected samples for analysis. Due to the size of the eight-meter animal, a tugboat had to be used to pull the carcass off the beach. If we leave it here um, and the tide comes in, it'll start moving it around. That'll pose a, a, a sort of a risk to the public in, in, in terms of entrapment. Um, it'll also start rotting and that might uh, obviously cause a massive nuisance factor. As you can see, this is a really popular beach and the last thing we would want is, is a rotting animal to stay here. For many beachgoers, the whale's carcass does pose certain risks and that includes increased shark activity. In order to mitigate that, authorities closed the beach while the boat began the retrieval process, 
The entire operation attracted the curiosity of beachgoers. We sometimes have whales reaching up uh, for you know, various reasons, sometimes obviously natural causes, um, sometimes obviously pollution, they suffocate with plastic unfortunately, so we do see this quite often here. Yeah, yeah. I guess when a whale beaches up, quite a significant animal will draw quite a crowd. Uh, obviously Clifton's quite a popular beach, so if there's a beached up whale, <laughs> people are going to come see what's happening with it. In the end, the well was successfully removed from the beach where it was towed to a slipway and taken to a landfill site to be disposed of. Gavs Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. Well, let's jump straight into the sport now. We start with the latest on the Africa Cup of Nations tournament that kicks off on Sunday in Cameroon. Tunisia are scheduled to take on Sierra Leone on Friday, some 48 hours before the tournament begins. The Carthage Eagles, who have been rocked by COVID-19 infections, open their Group F campaign against Mali on Wednesday next week. CGTN's Adnan Shawashi has more. The 2004 African champions, Tunisia, have been rocked by COVID-19 infections days before the start of the Cameroon 2021 finals. The Tunisian Football Federation announced that the second player in their squad, Saif Adin Jaziri, had tested positive for coronavirus. Midfielder Youssef Msekni had also tested positive. The health situation is difficult as all African teams will miss many players who are infected. We took preventive measures before announcing the final list for AFCON. The national school is ready for the tournament. Our objective is to prepare well and to win our games. Despite the coronavirus cases, the players say they are ready for the Afghan finals. Defensive midfielder Elias Sghiri declared that playing the African tournament will be challenging mentally and physically. This is the continent's top tournament. We are impatient to start the game. Our adversaries are strong, but we are ambitious and determined to give our best. Tunisia moved down one spot to 30th and 14th Africa in the latest FIFA rankings, released on the 23rd of December last year. It is logical that Tunisia has moved down despite playing many matches in December and losing the Arab Cup final. AFCON is a new occasion for the national team to move up in the next FIFA ranking. According to the Tunisian Football Federation, Tunisia are not permitted to replace Saif Adin Jaziri and Yusuf Msekni, who tested positive for COVID-19, as African squads were expanded from the usual 23 to 28 to cover potential problems with coronavirus. And then Shawishi CGTN, Tunis. Elsewhere, tournament favorite Senegal's national football team was forced to delay its flight to Cameroon for the Africa Cup of Nations as their preparations for the tournament suffered another blow when three more players and six members of the backroom staff tested positive for COVID-19. The Senegalese Football Federation named the players on Wednesday as Pap Sar, Nampalis Mendi and Mam Thiam. They and six members of the management team tested positive for COVID-19 on Tuesday when the squad was scheduled to fly to Cameroon, according to the Federation. Aliou Cisse's Senegal begins their tournament against Zimbabwe on Monday, and with star players including Liverpool forward Sadio Mane and Chelsea goalkeeper Edward Mendy. They are among the favourites to lift the trophy, having lost the 2019 final to Algeria. Now, with just one month to go before the Beijing Winter Olympics begin, Chinese President Xi Jinping paid a visit to several official venues in Beijing in the Beijing Competition Zone on Tuesday. The president visited the National Speed Skating Oval, Main Media Center, Athletes Village, uh, the Operations Command Center, and a winter sports training base. He learned about the game's preparations and how Chinese athletes have been training. Xi also extended the New Year's greetings to the athletes and staff members. And at the same time, the International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has expressed his confidence in China's hosting of the global cold weather sports showpiece in 30 days' time with, while stressing the importance of a safe and secure event. We are looking forward to successful Olympic Winter Games Beijing 2022. With these Olympic Winter Games, Beijing will write history being the first city ever to host both summer 
and winter editions of the Olympic Games. And by doing so, they will greatly benefit from the legacy of the Olympic Games 2008. These Winter Games will open a new era for winter sports globally. 300 million Chinese will become familiar with winter sport on snow and ice. The United Nations General Assembly approved the Olympic Truce Resolution by consensus of all 193 UN member states. This Olympic Truce Resolution is another demonstration that we can only accomplish our mission to unite the world if everybody respects that the Olympic Games must be beyond all political disputes. In this way, the Olympic Winter Games 2022 can set another great example for a peaceful competition.